September 12th, Unity Technologies announced an additional developer on September 12th, Unity Technologies announced an additional developer fee for the games built on their engine. Put simply, you can't put it simply because it's a mess. But the core of this update is a new charge per installation for games that make over $200,000 USD plus having 200,000 installs. Anyone with even a casual familiarity with software immediately picked up on several red flags of this new monetization scheme, and we are going to get into all of that and more, but let's go into a little depth about what game engines are so that we're all on the same page. Part 1. Game Engines. What do? So you want to make a video game. Alright, well, let's start with the obvious. You're going to need some art. Textures, models, animations, sound, music, pre-rendered video, pre-baked simulations, and more. Each of these come in a plethora of unique file formats that your game engine needs to know how to read in order to incorporate your art into the game. Developing this file interpreter? It's complicated. Okay, so we have software that reads and organizes all of our files. Nice. But this isn't the same thing as seeing our art on display. In comes our render loop. Every frame of a game you see is the result of an incredibly fast life cycle, working through several stages to determine the image we see on screen. Special rendering code called shaders tells our hardware how to display different parts of the game world. Structuring the render loop and having it communicate with the graphics hardware, it's complicated. Mmm, let us revel in all of this art. Lovely. Now that we can see it, what are we going to do with all of it? How do we give it life? How do we shape an experience for our players to enjoy? Here comes the second major aspect of our game engine, a scriptable update loop. Every game engine has its own unique concept of a thing that acts and reacts. The acting and reacting is driven by code built upon a framework that updates the game state between every frame we see on screen. Coding a genre agnostic framework to power this loop is um, pretty complicated. Look at our art go! So cool. But this is all in the engine's editor. We want to be able to hand this over to gamers chomping at the bit to play our new game. And up to this point, our game has been made on one set of hardware, meaning one set of instructions for running our engine's update loop on the central processing unit, the thingy that does all the thinking, and another set of instructions for displaying our render loop on the graphics processor unit, the uh, thing that makes the pretty stuff. But what if I want to ship on a PS5 or Android or a Mac or another PC with a different set of hardware components? Well, um, each of these machines have a different way they want to be told how to process your update loop and display your render loop. In comes the compiler. The engine compiler takes all of this data, all the internal organization and behavior and rendering logic, and it converts it into machine code that your target hardware can read. Special compiler logic is needed for every single set of hardware, and um, it's extremely fucking complicated. Not to mention the wild variety of possible input hardware, be that a gamepad, keyboard or mouse, touchscreen, body pose tracking, just to name a few. Detecting and communicating with each kind of input, it's complicated. I'm just scratching the surface here, but the takeaway is that- oh no wait, I'm sorry. Let's not forget the variety of middleware code libraries created for specific complex tasks, like physics simulation, audio and video playback, user interface design and rendering, all of which can save a lot of development time, but aren't simple drop-in and forget solutions. They have to be integrated in the engine like any other software, and that takes time, like all development does. You guessed it. Complicated. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg, but the greater point that I'm trying to make is that- Shit, fuck. Uh, I forgot to mention tools for multiplayer and social features, each requiring a deep understanding of network communication protocols, lag, data continuity, interfacing with proprietary platforms like PS Plus or Steam. Say it with me, friends. This is very complicated. Yay! I'm really just hitting the spark notes here, people. But all you really need to know is that before making a video game, which is a gargantuan effort on its own, there is a massive cliff-shaped barrier that is a toolset capable of game creation in the first place. Developers spend years building and maintaining engines, not games, engines, and it's why video games as an artistic medium didn't really have a ton of indie solo artists the way other art forms do. Because you have to be a savant in like 15 different technologies on top of having a creative vision and all the time in the world to make this shit. 
That is, until pretty recently. Usher in part two, democratizing the art form. Public engines like Unity, Unreal, CryEngine, and others have dramatically eased the barrier of entry, throwing open the floodgates to an entire generation of developers who can just work on creating their dream game without ever having to make or maintain their own engine. The future is bright. These public engines don't persist on passion and goodwill, of course. They are, after all, tools provided for profit, but as game engine companies discovered, charging for their tools introduces the same kind of catch-22 that engines have always suffered. Only devs with money can access the tools, and the only devs with money are those who release games. So Unity and other engine providers concluded that by initially providing their tools for free, they could continuously cultivate a community of growing game developers and make money from the most successful among them. Prior to their most recent announcement, Unity made money through yearly subscriptions per game developer based on the total revenue of a given project. This was supplemented by optional add-on services and purchases on their asset store. This pricing model was easy to understand, financially predictable, and like all subscription-based software, dependent upon a community of thriving developers to be profitable. This community is the heartbeat of successful software, helping one another by sharing what we've learned using the engine, helping the engine developers by reporting bugs and pain points in the editor workflow, and helping aspiring developers by creating a variety of educational content. Extra inventive Unity devs make powerful and highly specialized extensions for the engine, some making livelihoods from their work, while bringing additional revenue to Unity's business. Exceptional extensions sometimes just get bought outright and integrated into the engine itself. I can't believe I even have to say this, but if your goal is sustainable long-term profit, um, you shouldn't fuck with these people. This ecosystem of developers is what keeps your engine relevant and your business alive for years to come. Part 3. Fucking with these people. In December 2018, Unity made some unpopular changes to its Terms of Service, the legal contract you agree to when building games in their engine. 2018's changes called into question the viability of Unity's apps running uh, a cloud-based multiplayer service called Spatial OS. The studio that developed Spatial OS, Improbable, said this, Due to a change in Unity's Terms of Service, all existing Spatial OS games using Unity, including production games and in-development games of all developers, are now in breach of Unity's license terms. Overnight, this is an action by Unity that has immediately done harm to projects across the industry. Games that have been funded based on the promise of Spatial OS to deliver next-generation multiplayer are now endangered due to their choice of game engine. Ugh, well, uh, that doesn't sound great. Unity was quick to respond. Its chief technical officer at the time, Joachim Anti, turned right around with this follow-up. We terminated our relationship with Improbable due to a failed negotiation with them after they violated our terms of service. We've made it clear that anyone using Spatial OS will not be affected. We believe that even though Improbable is violating our end-user license agreement, game developers should never pay the price for that. And to Unity's credit, they refined their terms of service to be more flexible regarding third-party multiplayer services. In their final communication on the subject, they said this. The terms of service update highlights that developers can use any third-party service that integrates into Unity. Today's change in our terms of service means Improbable is no longer in breach by providing you a service and that we are able to reinstate their licenses. When you obtain a version of Unity and you don't upgrade your project, we think you should be able to stick to that version of the terms of service. Language in their terms reflected this, quote, If the updated terms adversely impact your rights, you may elect to continue to use any current year versions of Unity software according to the terms that applied just prior to the updated terms. Moving forward, we will host our terms of service changes on GitHub to give developers full transparency about what changes are happening and when. GitHub is a service that hosts project repositories, which is a copy of all the files in a project and significant changes to those files. The timeline of changes can be referenced, reverted back to, or used as the base for creating variations of the source project. Maintaining their terms of use on GitHub was a solid step to foster goodwill, showing a willingness on Unity's part to be accountable for how they intend to conduct business with us going forward. Humility, flexibility, these build trust, as does good faith support and some practical, mutually beneficial management decisions. So it goes, 
Trust is hard-earned over time, but just as easily lost in an instant. Part 4. An Instant. September 2023. On the day Unity Technologies announced its new installation fee, the company was flooded with a ton of predictable, sensible follow-up questions. Will all Unity apps going forward require an online connection to install? If not, what about apps that don't collect any metadata about a user's install history? Will reinstalls count? Will pirated installs count? What about games that are streamed through an internet browser? What about early access games? What about games sold in a charity offering like Humble Bundle or as part of a subscription service like Game Pass? What about bots set up to install an app hundreds of times to punish its developer? Unity's answer? I'm just a little baby publicly traded corporation. I'm just a little guy. I don't know, I just learned how to talk and walk and convolute long-standing pricing models for one of those popular public game engines on the market. I don't know quickly became clear that Unity either hadn't considered these scenarios prior to their announcement, or, if they had, didn't bother to inform their community managers about how the fee applied to them. Unity staff went into crisis management mode across social media and Unity's forums, trying to get clarifications as questions kept coming. These questions, all culminating, circling the central concern of all concerns, which installs count towards the fee, and how does Unity plan to track them? And Unity's message was clear. Don't you worry about it. Just trust us. We've got this super secret tooth fairy technology that lets us count installs without requiring your apps to be online or to violate the privacy of your player base, but we definitely can still get an accurate count, so don't you just worry about it. Thankfully, it's basically unheard of for corporations to overcharge its customers. So, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, just saying that. But don't you worry, friends. I am here to pull back the curtain on this whole fee calculation thing. I can tell you right now how Unity intends to tabulate this install metric, but bear with me. It is somewhat technical. Okay, uh... So step one, they... They make a fucking guess. Unity is just gonna charge you based on whatever analytics they have put through their proprietary data model that spits out an estimated number of valid installs. And let me tell you, there's nothing game studios love more than operating costs based on a guess. Especially a guess coming from outside their accounting department, especially a guess from the software provider their entire business hinges on. As Reddit user Leander Baratige II puts it, the real problem with this is simply costs you can't account for. A royalty on sales can easily be priced in, but here you get some random number and have to pay that, and there's no way to know beforehand how much it's going to be. Yeah, that is a pickle, Leon. Adding to that, Unity's assurance that invalid installs absolutely, definitely won't be counted is some real corporate, head-padding, hand-wavy, pie-in-the-sky bullshit. We all know how efficient, transparent, and customer-friendly corporations are with appeal processes. Just ask anyone unfairly hit with a copyright strike on this platform! Oh, but this great deal gets so much sweeter, y'all. It applies to all the Unity games currently on the market. Yeah, even those created under a previous version of Unity's Terms of Service. No, wait. We've already been through this. Unity assured us back in 2019 that we only have to abide by the terms set for the engine version we're using to build our game. It's right here in the GitHub repo they set up to... Uh, oh, that's gotta be a mistake, right? That's like mustache twirling levels of deception, deleting the repo made for transparency with your customers. Thankfully, we can still refer back to the language Unity added to ensure our right to operate under the terms for the version that Oh, that language has gone too. In the games industry, this is what we call shady as hell. Unity is right that their new installation fee only affects a small subset of their dev community, financially speaking, but retroactively applying this fee on games built in prior versions of Unity sends a very loud and a very clear message. The code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. Welcome aboard the Unity Engine, Miss Turner. Shout out to Reddit user Darkfrost for compiling all the relevant information about Unity's terms of service debacle in one easy to read post, which I've linked in the description below.
The way it was rolled out, this new fee undermines the presumed development costs of building for-profit games in Unity. Prominent Unity-based studios and content creators have decided this level of unpredictability just ain't worth it, and are warning others to stay away. Aspiring developers are going to be redirected to new engines. If Unity Technologies doesn't find a way to stop bleeding the mindshare of Unity dev experience, their engine will become obsolete and fade into obscurity. Part four and a half. Oopsie doopsie. Ten days after their initial announcement, Unity finally responded to the massive backlash against their new runtime fee. Instead of pulling install counts out of a fancy hat, Unity will now rely on self-reported install numbers. Development studios subject to the runtime fee can opt between a flat 2.5% revenue share or a fee based on the number of new users each month, whichever is cheaper. The fee is no longer retroactive, instead applying only to games shipped in 2024 and on. Unity reinstated the right to stay on the terms of use for prior versions of Unity Engine, as long as published games remain on that version. These new conditions are... fine. No one is happy to owe more money for the creative tools they use, but the fee as described here is sensible, easy to account for, and cheaper than other for-profit engines. But the fee was never the major issue. It was the slapdash way Unity announced it. It was the scummy way they tried to retroactively apply it. It was the demeaning way they tried to sell it to their consumers, like we're just confused or overwrought at their nakedly underbaked pricing plan. In retrospect, it's so obvious how easily this could have been avoided. The question now is, can we trust these jokers in the future not to do something equally or more egregious, considering how much of a great idea they thought this was? The last part of this video was filmed before Unity's latest announcement, but it remains just as relevant because, well, the trust is gone. Part 5. My Story I started using Unity as a wee little computer science undergrad in 2011. I've been a professional Unity developer since 2014, I have hundreds of dollars invested in the asset store, hundreds more in cloud storage and prior subscriptions. I've built a creative career on these tools. The past decade, I've gathered untransferable domain knowledge about Unity Engine and all of its many features. I wasn't going to say anything about this until next year, but one of the reasons I haven't been updating this channel as often as I'd like is because I've been hard at work developing a game in my spare time for the last year and a half. Not to be annoyingly vague, but my project relies on some highly specialized plugins that I just don't have time or the expertise to make on my own, and it took a lot of time for me to vet and learn and integrate these in my project, and it's unlikely that I'll find one-to-one -one replacements for them in other engines, and I just find myself staring at this body of work that I've sunk so much of my time and effort into unsure if I should try jumping to a new engine or else put my faith in Unity to make sound, consumer-conscious business decisions. Will Unity technologies be around long enough for me to finish my game? Will they change their monetization scheme again in a way that makes publishing untenable for me? Will people not want to fund me or work with me or possibly hesitate to buy my work because of the engine that it's built on? I mean, that last one maybe is a little hyperbolic, but I don't know. Unity could sneak in some code that bricks your gaming device unless I send them a trash bag of my used socks for every install flagged by their magic swarm of install-sniffing micro-machines. Superman City! One, two, three, four! No, sadly, still not that kind of micro-machine. I am going to make the best of this. Um, I'm just feeling pretty dejected right now. I, I don't feel like spending my time re-establishing myself in a new tool set. I'd rather just spend all that time making games and, and video essays for all of you. Part six, waiting for Godot. If the game industry is going to have any kind of future outside of corporate dominionism, that future must be open source. Blender is an open source 3D creative suite that has revolutionized digital art creation, chiseling away at an industry that has been calcified by stale, overpriced software. Nearly every visual effect in my videos is realized using Blender. This channel simply would not be possible without it. A success story similar to Blender's is what this industry desperately needs. Free tools that empower game creators deployable on any platform the community is willing to develop for. Because features of an open source engine are prioritized based on community interest and direct contribution, 
no one will have to worry about the unslakeable thirst of a boardroom or shareholders. Executives living on infusions of their own children's blood will no longer have the power to nullify millions of collective human hours of experience and creative work. Thankfully, there are several growing options in the open source game engine scene. You might have heard of Godot, a leading contender for the holy grail open source game engine. At a glance, it already has an impressive toolset, one worth looking into if you're trying to learn game development or switch away from a for-profit engine. It's going to take some time for open source engines to become powerhouse replacements for Unity, Unreal, and other for-profit engines, but what Godot and Stride and other open source engines have that for-profit engines will never have is that their relevance as a game creation suite will only ever depend upon the community's passion for making games in it. It's time that we cut out incompetent, greedy middlemen. I've pinned a list of open source software for creating games and digital art in the comments of this video. Please sound off below with your favorite open source creative software, and I'll be sure to add it to the list and attribute it to the first person I see recommended. The more creators empowered to make games, the more games there will be for all of us to enjoy. Y'all, I cannot wait to get back to analyzing games and not talking about how the executive class is ruining the world. But until then, friends, happy gaming.